making your way through the door. Um, we're going we're gonna to read some scripture here before we kick into worship. So y'all stand to your feet. I'm going to read uh, a portion from the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. Uh, at our house, we're big fans of this TV show called The Chosen. I don't know if anybody, anybody seen The Chosen? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Check it out. Uh, but anyway, we were watching the episode last night where, um, that I'm going to read here from Mark 2, where Jesus is preaching in Capernaum, and the paralytic man is lowered through the roof. Um, so here's Mark 2. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise up, take your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And that man rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out from uh, before them all. They were all amazed and glorified, God saying, we never saw anything like this. And so this is our hope. This is um, our hope on which we stand is this man, Christ Jesus, uh, who can not only forgive sins, uh, he, he does that which only God can do, um, and that is because he is God. So King Jesus, we love you, Lord. Uh, we're here for you today. Uh, Holy Spirit, will you come teach us more about yourself, uh, more about your goodness, more about your gospel? Uh, more about us and what that looks like for, for each of us, Jesus. You know, we love you. My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest phrase but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone. The weak and made strong. In the Savior's love. And through the storm. He is Lord. Lord of Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor, my anchor holds. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Say faultless. Faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak and made strong in the same. Oh, 
Lord, you are the cornerstone on, on you. Uh, everything else is built, Jesus. Uh, we're riding your coattails, Lord, uh, from everything that you did in your life, your death, your resurrection, uh, and now in your, uh, in your kingdom as you reign. Yeah, we love you, King Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a seat. Andrew's got some announcements for us. Hello and welcome to Fellowship Asheville. No matter who you are or where you are, we are so glad that you are here with us this morning. My name is Andrew Neighbor. I am the student ministry director here at Fellowship. And uh, this morning, I get to do something pretty fun, which we haven't done in a year, which is dismiss kids. If you have registered uh, for Fellowship Kids, now is the time. So if you're a kid in K through fifth grade, go ahead and head on back. Your volunteers are back there waiting for you. They are super excited. Um, it's a fun thing. And uh, if you want to register for next week, the link is in uh, the Fellowship Kids weekly email. And Fellowship Kids Junior, which is three years old through preschool, will launch um, the Sunday after Easter, which is April 11th. And uh, speaking of Easter, uh, this year for Easter, we're going to have two services, one at 9 a.m., and another one at 11 a.m. So go ahead and register for whichever one uh, best fits your schedule. We're also still going to be uh, broadcasting our 11 o'clock service at 11. So uh, there you go. And uh, one thing that we're doing that I'm pretty excited about is um, we're taking a mission trip to Haiti uh, this fall in October from October 3rd through 8th. And we're going to have an interest meeting about that uh, on March 22nd at 7 p.m. Uh, I'm going to go on the, to the interest meeting. I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, missions is something that I'm passionate about. Um, it is a medical missions trip, which honestly terrifies me, but I'm excited and I, I want to um, be there. And I, hopefully I'll see some of you guys at the interest meeting on March 22nd at 7 p.m. as well. And this week uh, for our family interactive worship piece, what we're doing is if you're at home, go ahead and grab uh, a piece of paper and something to write with. And, and uh, we're going to draw the Star of David. And fun fact, when I was a kid, this was the only way I knew how to draw a star, which was draw a triangle and then a second triangle over top of it. And uh, yeah, Fred's going to talk more about that and why we're doing that as, we, as he continues our series together in Ephesians. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Can y'all believe a year ago this Sunday was our first Sunday to be virtual? You know, I, I've said this before over the pandemic, we made the decision on a Thursday to go virtual. We had a meeting with our staff, with Adam Bennett, um, with Bill Meisner, uh, with Shay Smith, and we all sat around a table and said, okay, we made the decision to go virtual, now how do we do it? And uh, we put in, we kind of laid the tracks that day for what would carry us through the pandemic for this last year with, with doing Facebook Live and then getting cameras so that we could do church online platform and then the post-sermon chat, like all of that was discussed in that meeting um, uh, a year ago. And it's crazy to think that a year ago this Sunday uh, was the first Sunday we went virtual and how cool it is that the kids now get to go back uh, to their area uh, and experience fellowship uh, kids, that environment again, which is great. And during that season too, that we've also added this family engagement piece, which has been great for families as well. And so, so it's, it, it's been a year, period. It's been a year, right? Like in every way you can imagine. 
But yet, God has been so good through all of that, and I'm, I'm so thankful. Uh, if I didn't get a chance to meet you, my name is Fred. Uh, I am the lead pastor here, um, and uh, like Andrew said during announcements, uh, welcome. Truly, no matter who you are or where you are, uh, we really want to be a church for you and believe that we are a church for you. And today, here's what I hope happens. I, I hope uh, that through the message, through the worship, through, through everything that we're doing together, um, that, that somehow God does what only he can do and his Holy Spirit will inspire you to walk in more faith and trust with Jesus today than you had yesterday. And my prayer is that you'll have even more tomorrow than you do today. Um, that's what I hope happens. And so go ahead and open your Bible to Ephesians. Uh, chapter four is where we're gonna be. Chapter four, verse 17 through five, uh, verse 14 is where we're gonna go. And as you're turning there, uh, I want us to take a minute and align our hearts, minds, um, and souls with each other today. Because today, um, in this passage of Ephesians, Ephesians, here's what I've been asking the Lord to do, and that's to change all of us that we leave this service today different than we walked in, particularly in two areas, dealing with our expectations, particularly of who God is and what he can do, and dealing with our comfort, because I think those are two barriers uh, that we put up. And so, so my prayer for us has been this, I've been asking Jesus to do this and I'll explain it. Because today, here's what I've been asking. I've, I've been asking Jesus today, uh, I want you to L dad and me dad us. All right, now let me tell you about Eldad and Medad, right? Because if you're looking like, who in the world is Eldad and Medad? Let me, let me tell you. In Numbers 11, there is this, this great, um, um, gosh, if it, was, if it was today, it would be like this great tabloid story of what is going on in the nation of Israel. Because, because here's what's happened in the book of Numbers. In, in the book of Numbers, uh, the, the nation of Israel has left Egypt, right? And Moses has led them out and, and God has empowered him to do this. And the book of Numbers picks up where uh, the, the nation of Israel has walked through this God-parted Red Sea, right? And, and they've left their slavery, they've left their oppression literally drowning in the ocean behind them. Right? And so they're standing there in, on this new land, heading to the land that God has promised them. And, and, and before they head off, God does a couple of things. He, he wants them to know what worship is going to look like because they're in this new era, right? They, they, were, they were slaves in Egypt. They were under oppression. God has set them free. And he goes, hey, here's what I want worship to look like. And, and so God talked to, taught them about this tabernacle experience. And then... He said, and by the way, not only am I going to, you know, point out the promised land to you because it's promised, I'm going to walk with you, right? Not only am I going to lead you in front and behind, but I'm going to be with you every step of the way until you get to the promised land. I'll, I'll lead you by a pillar of smoke by day and, a, and a, a pillar of fire by night. You will never know that I'm, I'm, I'm not there. I'll, I'll always be there and I'm going to feed you as we go. I'm going to give you this stuff called manna. And they had never experienced manna before and, and, and nobody has experienced it since. We have no idea what it is. All we know is that God provided it and it was filling and sustaining. And they had to, to harvest it every day. Like it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't last except on the day of Sabbath it did. So with all of this, the nation of Israel heads off. And, and what is the first thing that you think that nation does? After God does all of this, do you think as they head off that they celebrate what God has done? Do you think, do you think that maybe they praise God for what he's done? No, in, in Numbers uh, 9, 10, 11, here's what you see. The first thing they do is they complain, right? After God does all of this, the first thing they do when they set off is they complain because they miss Egypt, right? Now, I guess they forgot the fact that they were under oppression and slavery, but they miss Egypt. And in particular, they talk about the onions and leeks that, oh, they miss that. They miss meat, this manna stuff that God's providing. It's not what they're used to. They're used to something else. Even though what they're used to is less than, it's still different. They miss meat. Now the Bible says that God heard them complaining. And it says that, that, that God got angry with them. 
because he has provided all of this and, and they're complaining. Now, here's what we have to understand going into this passage particularly is that, that God's anger might be different than what we expect it to be. Because when we hear the word anger, and here's what's interesting, the Hebrew word for anger, it doesn't help us a whole lot because the Hebrew word for anger is air coming out of the nose. That's what it is. Hebrew is this very picturesque language. And so it's air coming out of the nose. And in our post-sermon chat a few weeks ago, Andrew said, so it's literally this. And he posted this emoji, right? Like that's the picture that we have in our mind, that this, that this, this anger of God looks like this. But see, God's anger is different than our anger because in our anger, we typically say things and do things that we later regret, Right? God is all-knowing, all-powerful. Uh, he's not gonna do anything that he regrets, right? His anger is different. And here's, here's how we know this. And so, so what I hope that we can do is just kind of unpack this just a little bit. Because, because in Genesis 2, the word in Hebrew that's used for anger, it's the same word used to breathe life into Adam. Same word, same tense, same everything. So in Numbers 11, when it says God got angry and breathed air out of his nose, it's the same word that God breathed life into Adam. And so somehow in this Hebrew word where it says God got angry, it's different than the anger we experience with each other. It's, it, it has this component of life to it, right? Because it's the same word. If he can breathe life into Adam, and we have to pay attention to that, that God's anger is different than we might expect. And so this word anger isn't, isn't about just anger as we know it. it. It's also about life and that God's desire, here's what I think. I think that God's desire was and is for his people to trust him to give them life, even in a desert place. And to do it in ways that we don't expect, in ways that we're not comfortable with. And so what he did in Numbers 11, when, when they complained and Moses prayed and he went to God, God told Moses, do this. He said, pull 70 faithful men together. And he called them elders. And he said, bring them to the tabernacle, bring them to me and my spirit will fall on them and they will prophesy and, and I will empower them. And these men will help you deal with, with the people of the nation of Israel. And so they do, these men gather together and, and the spirit of God falls on them and they start prophesying. And man, it, it had to be this incredible, really, really cool moment. But something else happened. Eldad and Medad happened. See, Eldad and Medad weren't part of that 70 people gathering at the, at the tabernacle. For some reason, they couldn't leave their tent. They were, they were stuck at home. Anybody been stuck at home lately, right? That's Eldad and Medad, stuck at home. And yet, when the Spirit of God fell on those 70 elders, the Spirit of God also fell on Eldad and Medad, and they started prophesying, even though they weren't with everybody else, even though they were doing something different than what Moses expected, different than even what the people of Israel expected. Because when Eldad and Medad started prophesying, do you know what the, the nation of Israel did, what the leaders of Israel did? They didn't go, man, that is so cool they ran and told to Moses. And they said, Moses, you've got to see this. Like these guys are doing something that God didn't say. And in that moment, what happens is that Moses reflects God's heart in this and doesn't burn with anger, doesn't discipline them. Moses says, gosh, I wish everyone would do this. I wish the entire nation would prophesy. I wish that everyone would be filled with the Spirit no matter who they are or no matter where they are. In other words, God is saying through Moses, listen, y'all, God works outside of our comfort and our expectations because it's comfortable being with the 70 in the tabernacle. That makes sense. That's what we expect God to do. It's uncomfortable when God does something beyond our expectations. It's uncomfortable when God does something different than we expect him to do. And El Dad and Me Dad show us that God works beyond these barriers of comfort and expectation that we put up. 
right? Because when we expect God to do something, we get uncomfortable if he does something else. Uh, that can be a barrier that we put up. And, and God works beyond those barriers. And so today, I would love to see those barriers of comfort and expectations come down so we can all see God work in unique ways in our life so he can L dad and me dad all of us and change us and grow us in, in every area. Well, let's look at Ephesians 4 verse 17 because it says this. So, so this is the letter of Ephesians. Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus and, and, and one of the themes is unity and, and tearing down barriers that separate us from, from God and us from each other. And, and Paul says this, now, this I say and testify to the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And so what does Paul mean by this? Well, luckily he explains it. Verse 18, for they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from, from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves to sensuality, greedy practices of every kind of impurity. And so Paul says, listen, there's two ways that you're gonna, you're gonna live your life. You're gonna give your life to something, either your own pleasures Right, that's what he's talking about there. Or look at this, because what's the next word? The next, the next word in the next verse is but. So there's a shift. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Y'all repeat that after me. The truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. Right, and he says, either you're gonna give your life to yourself to your own pleasures, to your own wants, to your own desires, or you're gonna give your life to Jesus. And those are really the only two options in life. That's it. And he makes this point that the truth is in Jesus. And so his point is, then why would you go anyplace else? If the truth is in Jesus, then, then the rest, you know, pursuing your own self, the other is just ignorance. The life in Jesus is full of light. The other is covered in darkness. And, and, and Paul's response to these two choices is next. Let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Verse 22 says this. He says, so put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and that is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the hope and to put on the, the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so Paul's response to these two choices is to choose Jesus's way, right? And leave behind the old way. Leave behind the old way of just pursuing your own pleasures and your own wants and your own desires, but instead choose Jesus. It's, it's the Israelites in, in, in the desert. He's saying, leave behind Egypt, Right, Leave behind the things that you're comfortable with in Egypt, the, the onions and the leeks, and instead choose the life that I've laid out in front of you. Choose Jesus. Choose this new life with God and embrace this new life with God. Even, even if this means that you're gonna walk in unexpected places, even if this means you're gonna be stretched beyond what is comfortable for you, e even if you're gonna be like Eldad and me, Dad. Now, if you're following along in the family engagement piece, uh, Andrew said to draw the, the star of David, the, 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 which I, it's funny, I told him before too, I was like, yeah, that was the first star I learned to draw too. And it was like next level to do this star, you know, like, like that took some practice, right? Um, but here's what I want you to do. The, the reason I've chosen this is one, because my sermon has six points that we're going to get through fairly quickly. Uh, for those of you who like alliterations, they all begin with W, which is fun. So you'll be able to write one at each, at each, uh, um, at each point of the star. But two, if you notice this star of David, in the middle is a hexagon. And, and, and that's why the last phase of the Star of David is to erase or scribble out those lines in the middle. Because what I want you to do too is to draw a cross in the middle of that star or draw something that represents your new life in Christ. And I wanna visually see what this looks like when those barriers of comfort and expectation, those walls that we have are taken out. And God is able to stretch us and move us beyond where those barriers are. And we're going to see what Jesus uh, does when we, when we do that, when we allow God to be who he is beyond our expectations and beyond our comfort, that the barriers of comfort and expectation that we put up, you know, this, this, the, I'm hoping this will show us what this Jesus-centered kind of L-dad, me-dad life looks like. 
Because here's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see in this new life with Jesus, Jesus changes everything about us. Changes everything. Well, look at this first area that Jesus can take beyond our expectations and beyond our comfort. Look at what Jesus changes. In verse 25, it says this. Therefore, having, put in, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one of another. Be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. And so so Paul's going to give us some examples. And and the reason this sermon has six points is because Paul gives us six points. You're going to see that that word let repeated six different times with a command after it. And so I didn't come up with this six points. Paul did. So you 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 can talk to him about it. All right. But here we see Paul say that when Jesus is the center of your life, in this new life that you have, you, you speak the truth. Instead of telling falsehoods, instead of, instead of not telling the truth, you speak the truth. But who does he say in particular you speak the truth to? Who does it say in that verse? Speak the truth to who? Your neighbor, right? Speak the truth to your neighbor. But then he does something. He says, speak the truth to your neighbor. Check, got it. But then he starts talking about anger. He starts talking about anger in relation to your, to your neighbor. Now, this word anger is a unique word because it means to be provoked, right? It has this idea that, that something is poking you and provoking you and your response to that is anger, which is why Paul says, don't let the sun go down on what provokes you. And keep in mind, y'all, this is in context of your neighbors. Now, what I love about anger is it's it's this, this is counseling. This is where this comes from, right? I'm stepping away from my Bible for a little bit just to share with you some, some, some counseling wisdom that I have picked up over the years. And it's that this, that anger is often actually a masked emotion, which means when you say I'm angry, there's something behind your anger that's causing that anger. And the task is to figure out what that is. Because anger is always a response to something, which is what Paul is saying here. When you are provoked and it leads to anger, you need to unpack that and figure out what is provoking you to lead you to anger. Because guess what? It might have nothing to do with your neighbor at all. It might have something to do with you in your own heart, or it might have something to do with your neighbor. And in which case, one, if it's just you, you need to deal with it. And if it's you and them, then y'all need to deal with it together. But the point that Paul's saying is you've got to unpack that a little bit and see what's behind the anger. Now, the question is, why would Paul talk about neighbors and anger together? Right, because this verse is often used, don't let the sun go down on your anger, is used to talk about husbands and wives, right? It's a great application, but that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about with your neighbor. Anybody ever been provoked by a neighbor? Yeah, yes, right? Anybody ever struggle getting along with your neighbor? Anybody, anybody ever live next to someone who has different opinions than you? The sign in their front yard is different than the sign in your front yard and you don't know how to, how to handle that. Maybe it's a difference of political opinions. Maybe it's different child rearing techniques. Maybe it's even different religious opinions. Have you ever wondered how in the world you can get along with a person that God put right next to you? That's what Paul is talking about. That's what Paul is talking about. And not to beat a dead horse here, but Jesus tells this story about a neighbor. And he says that your neighbor isn't just the person that lives next to you. Your neighbor is the person that you like the least. The person that you think you are so opposite from, there's no way, there's no way that y'all could get along. Jesus says that is actually your neighbor. And so Paul is saying, listen, you've got to deal with what provokes you and you've got to speak truth, not just to your neighbor, but also to yourself about that. Because it's important. Because when you do, it actually eliminates Satan taking a foothold in that relationship. Satan taking a foothold in your neighborhood, Satan taking a foothold in this city, y'all, that's a big deal, isn't it? And if you want to know some specifics about what to do when you're provoked, then join me for the post-sermon chat because I'm going to talk about that. But Paul's point here 
is to, to not let this provocation in you be a reason for separation, but to deal with it. And see, if you don't let this barrier, if you, if you don't let this barrier build up, you do that because God's got something better for you on the other side. And so this first W, this first point is that when Jesus changes us, he changes the world through us. Because he changes the relationships with your neighbors. And when you change the relationships with your neighbors, you change the world. William Booth, uh, the, he co-founded the Salvation Army with his wife. And he said this about the gospel. He said this about a new life in Jesus. He said that, that the gospel not only changes a person's character, but it also changes their community. It changes their context. To the point where he said this, if a person's community doesn't change, then he questions whether they really accepted the gospel at all. Right, you see, church, when, when you become a truth teller in kindness and love, and Paul's gonna talk about it in a little bit, but, but, but when, you, when you deal with what provokes you and you don't allow Satan to have a foothold, when Jesus changes you and he, he's able to work in and through you in the world around you, it changes your family, it changes your friends, it changes your, your workplace, it changes your community, it changes your city, and that ultimately changes the world. Y'all, it's a big deal. Look at verse 28. And see what else Jesus changes. So he changes our world. That's one point. Verse 28 says this. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So, so when Jesus changes us, he also changes our work. He changes our world and he changes our work. He moves our work from being this thing that we earn money to make a living. That's what work is to being a, a, a job that you do, a work that you undertake. Instead of it being about a gain for yourself, it's about a benefit to others. Your work isn't about what you get for yourself. It becomes about what you can share through your work. You see, this barrier of comfort says, I need. I need these things to be able to make life good. And that barrier of comfort often has this phrase called standard of living. I have to have a certain standard of living. What I love about going on trips like to Haiti that we're doing, it shows you that actually to have a very vibrant walk with Christ, you don't need the things that you think you do. See, living beyond comfort and living in this place of El Dad and Me Dad, this place beyond comfort and, and, and expectation says that I give. And why? Because when you give, you show that you trust. It's why Jesus pointed out this, this widow who literally gave everything she had in the offering because she was trusting God to provide for her. You see, your work becomes a place of generosity, not a place of greed. When Jesus is allowed to get beyond this barrier of comfort and expectations, look at verse 29. Verse 29 says this, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And this word grieve, by the way, of the Holy Spirit is similar to the Hebrew word in anger. It kind of captures that same idea. That God's, when he lays life in front of us and we choose a different path, that, that God's anger might be more about sadness for us and grief for us because he's shown us everything that we need. And so do you see what changes here though in this? Like not only is it your world and not only is your work, but here we see words change. They go from tearing others down to building others up. They show grace and they're spoken at an appropriate time. And so when Jesus changes us, he changes the words that come out of our mouth. Now, I want to speak about appropriate time real quick because we, leave, we live in a, in a divided culture right now, don't we? We live in a cancel culture right now. And I've spoken about this before and I will probably still keep speaking uh, to it. And, and there are times where it is right and good to speak up and to let your, your, your biblical, God-centered, Christ-centered views known with grace and with truth. That's what Paul says. But there's also an appropriate time to keep your mouth closed. Has anybody lately had a spirit-filled, God-empowered moment where it took all of that just to keep your mouth shut? I have. 
right? That's what Paul is saying. When Jesus works in our lives, we know when to speak and we know when to be silent. And when the person that we're talking to or the person on the other side of that conversation, when they don't wanna hear your opinion, they don't wanna hear the truth as you see it, that is when you just close your mouth. And you listen with understanding and you listen with empathy, but you just keep quiet. And there's another tension point with our words that I think is equally as difficult during this time. That when you and me, as Jesus followers, that we can get, actually get comfortable tearing people down, can't we? We can get comfortable pointing out every flaw in them, every, everything wrong that they're doing. And, and here's what's interesting. In, in, in church, we've got to stop doing this. It is a trick as old as there is time that whenever we don't like somebody's message, but we can't figure out a smart enough way to disagree with it, we attack the messenger. Whenever you see someone attacking a person, chances are they've already, they're already off the rails, right? Our job is to build others up, not tear each other down. Now, I know some of you are so justice-minded and, and, and whatever numbers on the Enneagram you are, you're freaking out now because you're like, yeah, but I'm right and they're wrong. What do I do? Grace and truth. And maybe you keep your mouth closed until the right time. And when the right time is there, you speak with what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Someone once told me that you can be right while not being righteous. Right? You can have the right words and you can have the right truth, but you can deliver them in a way that is not godly and not the way that God intended us. Another person told me this, don't ever wrestle with a pig because both of you will get muddy and only one of you will like it. Right? Paul is showing us that we we can tear down this barrier of comfort being right because that's what fuels that a lot. And we can build right, we we can build righteousness when we build each other up when we show grace with our words and when we're quiet when necessary and we speak up when necessary, when we let God show up beyond our comfort and expectation in our words. Look at this next one, verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now listen, we all have emotional scars and wounds. Right? And those emotional scars and wounds, we've all been hurt by others. Right? We're humans. And every relationship you're in with another human is a messy relationship. Period. And in those relationships, we can get hurt. We can get hurt by other people's words. We can get hurt by other people's actions. And I need you to hear me. I am not excusing those things. I am not saying that's okay. But here's what I've seen. In the church world, and maybe this is true in the, other, in, you know, in the non-church world, but I just know the church world better. I know that we can hold on to hurt because it feels good. It feels good to have something against somebody else and we can hold on to that hurt instead of what the scripture says, instead of releasing that hurt. And when we hold on to that hurt, here's what happens to us. We become unforgiving people we turn into bitter people and we get angry. And here's what ultimately happens. Hurt people hurt people, right? And when we hold on to that hurt and we let that hurt continue to hurt us, then we go around hurting other people and we become the people that cause other people emotional scars and wounds. And we do it because we're holding on to our own hurt. But Paul says that there is a better way when we let that barrier of comfort and expectation down. And it's this, not only do hurt people hurt people, but listen to this, forgiven people forgive people, right? And we have been forgiven. You see, and and, and honestly, this is way outside of our comfort. As Jesus followers, we have been fully forgiven in Jesus. That your sin that separates you from this full life with Jesus and this personal relationship with God, that Jesus dealt with that on the cross and displayed his power in the resurrection. And all of your sins have been forgiven in Jesus. Every single one of them, the ones you've already committed, the ones you're gonna commit, like all your sins are forgiven in Jesus because of Jesus's death and resurrection. 
And when you say yes to Jesus, which by the way, I think is the most important decision you can make in your life. And if you haven't said yes to this Jesus and yes to his offer of of forgiveness and salvation, then do that today. When you say yes, all of those sins are forgiven. And you get to enter into this relationship with God that is, that is intense and that is personal. And it means that, that because God forgave you, you can forgive those who hurt you. Now, here's what this means. It means when you forgive them, you can begin the process of being free from that hurt. Does it mean you need to be best friends with them? That's a different question, right? Right now, I'm talking about you and the hurt you're holding on to. And instead of holding it like this, right? Because this is what hurt people do. They take that hurt and they hold it in their fist and, and, and it just oozes out from their hands. Instead of holding it like this, we hold it like this before God. And we say, hey, this is, this is the hurt that I've experienced. And in the name of Jesus and by the blood shed in Jesus, I am forgiving this person of this hurt and we offer it up to God. And what happens is then we experience a freedom from that hurt. Here's the deal with, with, with doing this, forgiving people, forgiving people, forgive people. You're not letting them off the hook for what they did. All you're letting is you're removing that barrier and letting God deal with them and you're letting yourself off the hook. You're letting yourself experience freedom. And see, here's the deal. Forgiveness can happen right now, right? And if you're worried about the restoration of the relationship, that can happen over a long haul. But forgiveness can happen right now. You can be free from hurt right now. And I'm telling you people, I've done it and it is life changing. And then you have to do it again and again and again because Satan keeps throwing it back at you. But it is life changing. You see, when Jesus changes us, he heals our emotional wounds. That's the other W. He heals our emotional wounds and the things that hurt us don't have to hurt us anymore. Look at chapter five. It says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexually immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, covetousness or covet is a word we don't use very often, but I wish we would to be honest, because it is a great word. Because what covet says is it says, I want what you have. That's what covetousness is. And, and if we used it, it would expose what we really want because we can covet someone's spouse. Bible calls that adultery, but, but we can fantasize about what life would be like with someone else. It's covetousness. Right? Kids, you can covet someone else's toys, right? Someone else's gaming system. You can want what they have. That's covetousness. Adults, anybody watch any decorating home reno shows and get covetousness about, ooh, all of a sudden I need a new kitchen, right? Right? We want what someone else has. We want the the new home, the new decorations. Maybe we want the promotion at work that someone else got. But when Jesus changes us, he changes our wants. He changes our wants. There's a psalm that says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And that verse is oftentimes taken out of context to say, hey, uh, God will give me what I want. That's not what that verse is saying because right before that, it says dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. In other words, deepen your relationship with God. And from that comes this delight in the Lord where it doesn't mean that he gives you what you want. 
what he does is he changes the desires of your heart. He gives me the desires of my heart that are like his. You see, when Jesus is the center of our life and we let down that barrier of, of comfort and the barrier of expectation of how God is supposed to respond, he changes our wants and changes our desires from instead of coveting, from I want to thanksgiving. Look at what I have. It's that whole, that whole concept of scarcity thinking versus abundant thinking. Scarcity thinking says, look at what I don't have. And abundant thinking says, look at what I do have. Look at what God has given me. And instead of being covetous, saying, I don't have enough and I want more, Jesus changes it to look at what I do have. God has been so good and I can be thankful for it. Look at verse six. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were, dar- you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You see, church, when Jesus changes us, he changes those we walk with, right? He changes those we walk with, and he changes even how we walk, which means this, y'all, we can be friends with anyone. Right? That is the joy of the gospel, and that is how the gospel goes out, is we can be friends with anyone. But those friends that are the closest to us, they need to walk in the same light that we do. Those close friends, the, the people we date, the people we marry, the people who are best friends, they need to walk along Jesus beside you, because that's what this is saying. When Jesus changes you, he changes who your partners in life are. He changes who your friends are. Now, I went through that real fast. Each one of those I could have camped out on, right? There's some great stuff there that I just skipped right over. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to just take a minute, all right? And we did six W's. We did, see if I can remember them. World, works, wounds. What's next? What'd I miss? Words, what's next? Want and then with, right? Thank you for those of you here following along, right? Each one of those, I really think we, each of us have put up a barrier for at least one of those, if not all of them. And I wanna take just a minute and give us time to pray and to reflect and to let the spirit of God speak to you specifically about where you need to drop a wall of comfort and expectation and let God change a specific area in your life. So, so, so what I'm asking is I'm asking the spirit of God to show you, to convict you and to, and to lead you into repentance. And so we're just take a minute and I'll pray and I'm going to lead us through some prompts and then Cam will come up here and finish this up and, and worship today. Jesus, Uh, man, this letter in Ephesians is so good and so rich and so deep and there's so much. And and, and I feel like this is just a a rock skipping over the surface uh, of a pond. Um, But yet, Jesus, it is your word. And and your scripture says that when your word is preached and teach, that it will not return void, but it will do exactly what it is meant to do and that it will change us. And so God, I ask you to send your Holy Spirit uh, in a very powerful and clear way today to let us hear from you. And let each one of us, whether we're here in this place or at home watching, speak to us about where we need to lower that comfort and lower our expectations. And maybe, maybe it is in allowing you to change the world around us. Maybe, maybe someone here has gotten very comfortable being separated separated from the world, separated uh, from their neighbors, separated from those that they love. Father, would you, would you show them that that wall has already been torn down by you and they can trust you. They can trust you to step beyond. 
and to see what you're going to do on the other side. Or maybe it's, it's, it's their work. And they have this expectation of work benefiting them. God, would you, would you show them how their work can actually be for the benefit of others, how their work can fuel generosity, how their work can, can give to, to things that you are doing uh, far beyond uh, what they could do in their physical uh, efforts, but, but maybe they could fund works that are going on all across the world, works that are going on here in, in, in Asheville. Show them that. Or maybe it's their words. Maybe Maybe we've grown comfortable tearing people down or we've grown comfortable speaking when we need to be quiet. Would you help us to use our words to build up and to give grace? Or maybe it's wounds. Maybe, maybe we've been hurt and we just keep hurting people in return. And Father, maybe you could show them just the depth of their forgiveness in you and that that would change this place in their heart where they can actually let that hurt go and let it go into your hands, not just out into the air, but let it go into your hands so that you, you can deal with it. Maybe it's their wants. Maybe we believe we'll be more comfortable with what someone else has than what you have given us. Jesus, would you build our thankfulness for what you have given us? Help us to see clearly what you've given us. Or maybe it's those that we walk with that that other Jesus followers disappoint us time and time and time and time and time again. And, And the people that have hurt us are the people that say that they follow you and it's really confusing to us. Well, Jesus, I ask that you would blow our minds with your power, blow our minds with who you are, and don't let us get confused about who you are with who your people are, because you are better, because we need you. So, Father, may we sit in the truth that is in you, Jesus. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Y'all stand up as we respond and worship.
prayer in my life. In my life, be lifted high in our world. Be lifted high in our love. Be lifted high. In my life, be lifted high in our from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son the Spirit to 
the King of kings. Praise forever to the King of kings. Yeah, amen. Fred, you want to close us here? Let's, let's pray. Jesus, um, you are incredibly good to us. And uh, even through song, we, we praise you and we see you. And so, Father, I thank you for that. As we leave this place today, Father, may you tear down those barriers that we build. May we live in the fact that you have already torn them down. And may we experience you beyond what we expect and beyond our comfort. And then may we praise you even more as we leave this place. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all, you are welcome to stay here and chat uh, at your tables. Um, uh, We're going to go ahead and and dismiss those so parents can go down and get your kids and fellowship kids. But here, if you do want to chat, here's what I'd love you to chat about. Share the W word that struck you the most, like what resonated with you the most, if you'd like. All right, y'all have a great week. I love you, and I love being in the church with you, and I'll see you next time.